Attention all FD fans. If you are heading to an event this year, I've got an easy way for you to save yourself five bucks. So when you go to pick up tickets for any of the eight events, that's any of them, Long Beach, you know, Seattle, Atlanta, whatever it is that you want to go to, at checkout, use the code FD Podcast. It'll save you five bucks doing this for the 20th season. So head over, use the coupon code, save yourself some money, and I will I'll see you out there. Maybe you'll see me walking around. I don't know. All right, guys, welcome back to the Editor Zone, the official podcast of Formula Drift. I am Jacob Gettens, and we have the legendary Vaughn Gittin Jr. on. Uh, Vaughn, super stoked to finally get this what all up? set up. This is awesome. I'm stoked, man. Yeah, always uh, always fun chatting with you. Looking forward to it. Let's ride. Yeah. All right. So we're, we're, you're you're in like the beautiful RTR studio right now. A lot of like parts install videos, some review stuff going on in there. Um, what's uh, What's that set look like right now? Like, like what's what's the other side of the camera? Is everything in chaos or are you uh, is all clean and tidy? Yeah, no, too? this is actually my office. Uh, so myself and my assistant are in here. Um, we've got a couch. I can't reach the camera. Sorry, I would turn around, That's all but good. I don't want to disrupt too much. But yeah, no, it, I mean, I guess my office has a little bit of chaos. <laughs> um, but no, yeah, this is where we do, you know, um, we'll do, we have a green screen. So we'll do some like video review stuff. In fact, Chelsea was here yesterday or the day before and we did a review of uh, our uh, Toge, uh, Mustang Toge video we did. And anyway, we do some parts reviews and stuff like that here. So uh, yeah, just cool little set, you know, make it look, look a little pro. Yeah. No. Fake it till you make it, you know? Yeah, dude, that's, hey, that's what it's all. I mean, outside of this, it's just like scaffolding. There's nothing. <laughs> it's just this one square that looks good. Everything else is chaos. So that's why I always ask. Um, no, it's good. How, how often are you even in the office these days? Are you pretty much just out and about? Yeah, it, you know, um, I've been really like trying to keep that like work life balance. Like my on paper schedule is in the office three days a week, and that'll shift depending upon what's going on. I mean, you know, let's be honest, I'm here probably five days a week most of the time, mm -hmm. but. Um, I do shoot to be off on Mondays and Fridays and that kind of supports like some level of consistency to support my travel schedule as well. Cause traditionally when I'm doing events, it's usually a Friday, Saturday, Sunday deal. So, um, but yeah, it, it really varies. Um, but I've been here a lot the last, you know, the last week, couple weeks, a lot going on right now. So, um, you know, I, I just adjust as the team needs me and, and, you know, things I need to get done. Yeah. That's, I mean, it's tough when you start to add in everything over the year. Right. And I'm sure once the summer hits, it becomes like hop and hop and hop from one spot to another. But, um, obviously you've made it a priority over the last couple of years to modify that schedule to be a little bit more family oriented. Yeah. I mean, look, I was doing 30 to 40 events a year for like ever. And it just got to the point of like, you know, this is, it's just, it's just too much. And I need to focus on quality over quantity. You know, I'm literally you know, a professional fun haver. So I got all these fun opportunities come to me and I'm just, you know, yes, 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 yes. And, uh, you know, that's great. Cause that has earned, you know, earned me to be where I'm at in this moment. Um, but you know, I, I had to take a step back just for my mental sanity for my family. I'm a father of two now. And so, it's been working well. You know, my, my personal targets are to pick like the 15 most important things a year to do event wise right now. And then, you know, a couple things will pop up here and there that, you know, I take on. Um, and that obviously doesn't include, you know, special like video projects and things like that. And so that's, that's been working well and, and earning me the balance that I need, to uh, you know, stay healthy, be a good father, be a good husband, and, uh, you know, continue to be a halfway decent president of my companies. Was there, was there like a moment where that kind of came through where you're like, oh, I'm, I'm either burning out or I'm dropping the ball somewhere else? Like, is there, was there, was there a particular time that triggered that? You know, I think it was just, just, you know, I'm, I'm always like in self-evaluation. Like, am I doing the things I should be doing? Does this make sense? Why am I doing it? You know, and always like questioning myself in, at some level. And um, the I think the thing that was a turning moment for me was just the father thing. You know, when we had Gunner, I just wanted to be, you know, a good father and spend time and not miss 
that, you know, that young time, you know, everybody that you talk to, you know, one thing you'll learn when you become a father is you get a ton of unsolicited advice. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that was consistent was don't miss these times, you know, the three, the four, the five, like, because eventually they don't want to hang out with you, you know? And um, these are also the moments that they're most impressionable and they're learning so much. So, you know, my goal is to, uh, you know, mine and Abby's goal is to, you know, raise our kids to be their best version of themselves and not be projecting the things on them that were projected on us as kids and just kind of let them be and give them this, um, you know, space to live in and be themselves. And so, that's hard to do when you're relying on other people to raise your kids. And so for me, I wanted to be, you know, I want to be a part of, of their life to the best that I can, but also, you know, I have passions and things that I love. So it was really just like I had, okay, I have to find this balance because I've seen this happen before with other people's kids that I've been able to watch. And, um, you know, one of my big inspirations, you know, of, of parenthood was Ken and Lucy, mm -hmm. And the way that they raise their kids and things like that, and so, uh, so yeah. Short answer: the the you know having a son is really what kind of changed my focus and uh, made me just kind of set boundaries. I never had boundaries before. I was just like taking everything in that I could, and you know, there, I, I'm kind of sick in the fact that like I love the business, I love the concepting projects, I love the challenges, I love driving, like so that can very much take up your schedule when you're that type of person. And so I had to, you know, set some boundaries and, and, um, it's, it's hard because, um, you know, let me sitting back from FD last year was, it was exciting and, and invigorating, but you know, I, I love that. I love drifting. And so, um, so yeah, it's, you know, it's that constant progression of life, you know, and, and just trying to make the best decisions for the big picture all the time. Yeah. I remember seeing you in Long Beach, um, on the headset. I think you're up in like one of the VIP stands watching turn one with Adam coming out and like, you could see the intensity that you had as like a team owner and as a coach, but there was also, I mean, there was definitely that feeling where you're like, ah, oh, I like, I, I could be there. Like I, I, I want to jump in the car and just show you, like, I'm trying to communicate what that is, but like if I could just sit next to you really quick and show you what you need to be doing, that would solve all these problems. So there was still a little bit of antsiness that was, was kind of there. I mean, maybe I'm reading into it a bit much, but I just, I, yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. I mean, yeah, you know, look, I've been drifting has been a part of my life for over 20 years. I mean, I've never done anything consistently ever that long, you know? So, um, it's, it is then that was obviously my first moment of that. Like this is real at that moment, right? So it was a pretty good read. Um, you always think you can do things better from outside the car too. So that was something I, I learned this year. But um, no, but it was, it, for me though, it was it was like the greatest thing I could have done because it gave me such great perspective. It allowed me to be a fan of a sport that I hadn't been a fan of till since 2002. You know, like I got into drifting and I, you know, I've never really, I've never really been a fan of motorsport in general, mm. but like I loved drifting and gravitated towards it and like enjoyed watching videos of it and, and things like that. And then once I got mm. so into it, you know, you just kind of are in it and it was fun last year to step back, be a fan, but also have the opportunity to be a, a mentor for a driver that I believe in, you know, like I had already, I think I've already kind of you know, stepping to Long Beach last year, like walking into that moment, Chelsea was put in the position of the lead driver. Like my, my, what I could do for Chelsea was done in that, in my mind there. Like he was, Hey man, like we've been together for a couple of years. Like you're now stepping up, you know what you're doing. You don't need me. And then I was focused on Adam. Um, and you know, I really believe in Adam and his capability. And so what you saw was me wanting to extract what I knew he had in him for everybody else to see in that moment. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, also, you know, there's a lot of new for me, like, when do I step in? When do I not, you know, like, so there was a lot of, a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of learnings there. And my approach really to last year was, you know, I was very much involved in Long Beach in Atlanta, I was 
less involved because I knew I wasn't going to be at the rest of the round. Right. So then it just kind of like let the team go. And then come Irwindale, I was just a fan. Mm-hmm. I did not get involved at all. I didn't even go down to the cars in the pit. I was just a fan. And mm-hmm. not that I didn't want to be down there, but I didn't want, you know, I know I'm a big energy and I didn't want to affect the amazingness that the team had curated on their own uh, that, that then. So, so yeah, it was, it was really cool to step back and be a fan and have the opportunity to assess what's going on in drifting, watch the fans, see the type of engagement that's going on in the pit, see the type of driving that's happening, what the judges are looking for and just have a revitalized you know, perspective of the sport. And, you know, what I saw was this flourishing sport that is in its golden years right now. Mm-hmm. I mean, last year I felt was like the biggest ever. Like I couldn't believe the crowds. I couldn't believe the action on the track, you know, and, and maybe it'd been like that forever. And I just didn't have the perspective, but like, I just feel the vibe around the sport is so vibrant right now. And uh, it was just really cool for me to, you know, I've been head down, ass up for a long time. So it was nice to get my head up, look around, take some breaths, acknowledge and admire what we've built, what we've, you know, what we've been doing for the past 20 years and um, cheer on, cheer on our boys. Yeah, it's, I mean, I could imagine it being difficult in a lot of regards, but also very refreshing to be able to step back and have that perspective again. And and I mean, I, I even seeing you at Irwindale and you and I chat a little bit like, it seemed like your energy towards the fans was a little bit more rejuvenated because you're not coming out of a hot car. You weren't dealing with issues. Like I'm sure there was still team issues and stuff going on that you're, cause you're still working at the end of the day. But like, I mean, I think you, you stayed until every last person had seen you and shook your hand and stuff like, like not that you didn't do that before, but like you were, you had the full energy the whole way through. And we're standing there just going like, yeah. how is he doing this? Like I'm tired watching this. <laughs> Yeah, well, it was, you know, look, man, I'm grateful for my people. Like, they're the only reason why I'm here. The only reason that, you know, they, you know, they've kept the relevance of me for so long, you know, so I owe a lot to them. And in those moments when I don't have anything else to do, I'll sit there all night, you know, because I, that's the least that I can do to give back. And so, yeah, it was, it was amazing to just be a fan at Irwindale and be lying if I didn't tell you I wanted to be out there trying to crush some feelings, but um, it was, it was cool. You know, it was just a great new perspective. And, you know, one thing that I've, you know, started to realize is like, you know, I think we as humans are always trying to rush and get to the next thing and we're not living in the moment enough. And so for me, that started to become a a focus of like, you know, live in the present, you know, I definitely have to live in the future being a, a business owner, but it's those present moments that I cherish the most you know, and, um, and so that was Irwindale for me, you know, like, it, cause it was, it was such like the, it was like, okay, Long Beach, it was new to me. I was like, I was just going to work. Am I, am I going to like this? You know, how's it going to go? Then I progressed through the year as the team owner and the guy not competing and drifting. And then Irwindale, I got to like embrace everything that our team had accomplished and built and just watch it, you know? And so it was just, Really, really cool new perspective for me. And um, just super proud of of what, you know, how Chelsea stepped up. I enjoyed, like, I'm a super fan of Chelsea driving now. Like, he is such another, another animal to watch on the track. Even when he goes too hard and makes dumb <laughs> mistakes and I want to be pissed. And I'm like, dude, all you had to do was like 5% less and you would have won. But like the just excitement that he gives is like no other. And so I got to be on the other side of that rather than being the teammate and the friend just wanting him to succeed and win. I got to feel the Chelsea Denofa on the track, you know, un- un- unadulterated, any, you know, no, no filters on it. And, and that was, uh, that was really cool, really cool moments for me. And, you know, to sit back and watch Adam progress from Long Beach to finishing fourth at Irwindale. Um, and then just to watch our team come in their own without me there. Yeah. You know, and and 
you know, I mean, a lot of these guys have come here because of me and, and what, you know, what has been built around me and to be able to step back and watch it be successful without me was uh, an absolute honor and just gave me so much pride of the group of guys that, that we have here at RTR. Yeah, I'm glad you touched on that because it's something I wanted to bring up. And it, because like looking through all of the people that you've worked with or have worked for you, there's this lineage of of incredible success. Not not like when they leave what you're doing, but there's all of these people in the motorsports industry. I mean, large chunks of race service. Sam Nelvin's an easy one to pick out. But then we talk about Nate going on and and doing some. I don't want to get into people's careers, but like doing some incredible things in in apparel and even, you know, Crenshaw working for you now and Corey and the whole team. I kind of want to shout out the whole team, but I, I'm, I'm going to miss some people. But like <laughs> all of these different people that have worked under your supervision, I guess, that have gone on to do incredible things. Have you, is like, is there anything that you think you're doing right that's causing that? Or is there like a mentality that you've brought in? Because it's it, there's just this linear line of like, you work for Vaughn, you go on and do something incredible. Yeah, it's interesting. I've I've never really thought about that. So I can only really speak to like how I do things and like my you know, my ethos in business and in being the president of a company is not like related to ego of being a president and being successful and winning championships. It's more about you know, I always tell my guys like I work for you. Like my job as a president is to give you guys the tools that you need for the opportunities that we're out here curating and the things that are in front of us. And so I just look at myself as another team member. But the one thing that I am very, feel very strongly about is vibe and being positive and not being somebody that like I'm glass half full all the time. And, you know, I mean, of course we all have our days and I got to like kick myself in the back of the head and just be like, yo, class is half full. Like there's the win, Mm -hmm. you know? So, um, I think that that gets contagious and I think that that attracts like-minded people because people I believe are attracted to passion and energy and vibe more than money or at least, or at least the people that the people that get the big picture, you know, event, you know, some people go and chase money and at some point they realize that that's not the thing. Mm. So what I find is that the people that we are attracting are wanting to be part of something bigger and they're hungry to learn and they want to do cool, unique things and they're passionate and they want to bring their passion to other like-minded, passionate people. And so with what you're saying is when, you know, people go off, you know, would come with us for a bit and then go do other things. I think that's probably something they take with them. And they're, when you are that, when you have passion, that is when you get rewarded. So when you're doing the things that feel good to you, that you're passionate about, that you wake up excited about every day, the universe rewards that. And so I think that that becomes contagious in this building and then I think that that's one thing that always stays with anyone. So irrespective of what they do or what skill set they learn here, I think that is the key and the recipe to the success that that you see for those that are around us. Um, and yeah, I've never thought of, th- really had a thought of it. So I was really just like off the cuff. No, hey, that's um, what I was hoping for. But that's what feels. That's what that's what feels like the the answer and the the reason. And like to me, like. That's the secret. Yeah. And I've been, you know, I've done a lot of reading and studying and like understanding some of these things. But for me, it's just been very natural. Like I've always been someone that like when things don't feel good to me, I don't do them. Mm. Uh, or I, I suck at them and I don't do them. And so I've stayed away from that from from an early age. You know, like it's, it's one thing to like want to learn a skill, right? But it's just like there's this natural feeling. Like, you know, you've been around people. You're like, oh, I don't don't really want to be around that person. Like he doesn't feel good Mm -hmm. around me. And so, um, so yeah, so I've just gravitated towards the stuff I like and that is hence professional fun haver. Like I just, the things that are fun to me, like that's my compass. Mm -hmm. And I think that that resonates with everybody that's in here. Um, you know, it's not fun a hundred 
uh, you know, 365 days a year, 100% of the time, but we find the fun, you know, uh, in just about everything we do. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's going to be hard days no matter what, but I think maybe what you're alluding to is how you get through those hard days, like what attitude. It's not just grind it out, make it happen. It's like, okay, well, let's find a way to enjoy this struggle again. Like, you know, I um, I worked in kitchens for a long time and and it's one of those group mentalities when it's a really busy night and things are going wrong. It's like, okay, we might all be screwed right now, but we're we're all screwed at the same time. So like, let's just turn up the music, like make it happen. Like we have to get out of this one way or another. So we might as well enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. Find the fun, you know, find, find the win in the present moment, mm-hmm. you know, and not what happened a minute ago, not what's going to happen there, but, but find it in this moment. Yeah. And, you know, I think I, I do that a lot by just finding the gratitude. Like whenever I want to be pissed about something, I'm like, what am I mad about? Look what, look what we're doing. You know, like this has been, this is the dream, mm-hmm. you know, and this is what I've been, you know, dreaming of, uh, forever. And, and, you know, and I always tell you know, my guys, like it's, it's truly my hope that, you know, this started as my dream, but you guys are the ones that are making this dream happen now. Mm-hmm. You know, it started with me and my dad and, and Abby, um, you know, and, and, you know, my goal is that my dream fills the dreams of everybody that's in, you know, this building, which is now over 60 people. I mean, it's just it's crazy, crazy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you know, a little bit of, a little bit of my philosophy of approach. I mean, I'd love to, you know, say I was like super strategic in everything that we do, but I just do business and treat people with my heart. And that's just what it's always been. And that's why when you see me, you that's what you get always. You know, I haven't, you know, shifted one bit since uh, since I started this game. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the the passion definitely and and that the the way that you're operating now, I mean, going going back, like if we look back to like white S13 days, obviously part of that ethos you have now is what took you from, you know, doing motocross to, you know, leaving your IT job to just basically go all in on this thing, right? And that that led to Falcon in the early days pretty much right away. And I mean, I, I, yep. I would kind of be curious, like what, where, where did it go from there? Because I think, I think your, your very early history has been covered a lot. And for new fans coming into the sport, it's important to cover that stuff. But there is this, yeah. this strange period where you get that Falcon, you know, spot and then you win a championship. And there's kind of this gap in between where I don't think it's been spoken yeah, about a lot. No, you're right. It's funny because I've talked I've, I've talked about this because, you know, there's been so many new fans that come in and I think a lot of people just see me as like the guy with all those monsters, yeah. you know, like the, you know, like it all fell from the sky, like a oh, monster Ford, you know, and um, they, they're right. There's not a, a lot of focus on like the struggle and where it started. But yeah, I mean, look, I, I started this just like everyone else starts in drifting. You know, I didn't have, I wasn't as like bred race car driver. I was a, you know, skateboarder, I race motocross and I love cars. And when I, I saw a video of drifting in Japan, it was uh, one of the exhibitions they were doing at Ebisu. And I was like, what? Like this sport that you can drive badass cars. And it's like skateboarding. Like the, it's like skateboarding with cars, mm-hmm. like not only just the action, but like the vibe, like literally going to like drift out Wednesdays at E-Town you know, I would leave work, my IT job early. I would drive my S13 with tires. Like I would be scrunched up for three hours because I got tires and jacks in the back of the car driving there. And, but it would literally be like going to skate park with my friends, you know, and we'd all be just hanging out and watching each other rip. And it's just a great vibe. And that's what made me fall in love with the sport. And I literally blew every dollar that I had paying my bills and working on my car. And, um, you know, I did that, went to as many events as I could and, and made a name for myself. And, and I got invited out to the Nopi World Finals, October 2003. And, uh, yeah, I, I maxed out my credit cards and to ship my car there. Not advisable. It was the this first. This is not financial advice. For the first, <laughs> it is not financial <laughs> advice. I shipped my car to Kaz because I still had a viscid limited slip out of a 300ZX in my S13. I shipped it out to uh, Kaz uh, and got a two-way limited slip. I'll never forget leaving, flying into California. My first time, a Maryland boy, never been out west, flew to California, 
got a cab to Kaz, jumped in my car, found the first church parking lot on the way to the Fontana for the event and started drifting in the church parking lot, feeling my new two-way. And then I went to the event and um, I was doing demos with Team Orange. It's where I met Dai Yoshihara for the first time. It was like my first experience meeting a real, like only Japanese speaking Japanese man. Mm. And we were communicating like cavemen. And I was so enamored with this, uh, with the conversation. And, um, but anyway, on the business side, I came armed with proposals to that event. I was like, you know, what? I'm gonna make this investment in myself. I've got this opportunity. I walked around to all the vendors there, gave them a proposal. A couple weeks later, that's when Falcon had called me. And, um, and that was 03. So Formula D had just announced Formula Drift. And, um, yeah. And so, you know, that they called me and, and I was like amazed because I loved, um, I loved the team, you know? Um, and, and, you know, Kaguchi was like, I loved his style. Mm-hmm. And so now I'm like, you know, fast forward a bit, you know, now we're showing up to Atlanta, Road Atlanta. I've open trailered my S13 that was now fa- painted in the Falcon livery, you know, uh, and, and, you know, run Road Atlanta, which by the way, was my first time ever pulling a handbrake. No way. Just put that in perspective. Yeah. First time ever. Huh. Everything else I had done was power over, clutch kicking, you know, big feints, but Road Atlanta, staying at the top of that hill being like... I'll see if this works. So, I mean, that was, but, you know, if you talk to a lot of the OGs that were there, like we were all just figuring it out and progressing together, you know, you know, and, and we progressed fast and, you know, fast forward, you know, um, you know, 2005 or that year Ford debuted the Mustang. And and I remember this, this image, you know, I don't know if you want to look, look it up, but it's, the Mustang GTR that came out, it was a concept car. And I saw it and I was like, holy crap, that thing is sick. And I never was a Mustang guy before. Like I never thought Mustangs were cool. And, um, and then, uh, you know, so we decided that year to, to build a Mustang. Um, and, and kind of the rest is history, right? We debuted in 05, won the USA versus Japan, in 2005, I'm still working a full-time IT job. So I'm leaving or work early on Thursdays, either trailering my car or my dad's trailering it. And I'm flying in depending upon what the, where the event was, come home on, you know, Sunday night or bring a red eye Sunday, take a shower, go straight to work. And I did that from 04 to 07 when I finally decided to quit my job. And I had a cushy job. I mean, I was was I when I quit? I was 27, making like 85 grand a year, getting like yeah. 20, 25 thousand dollar bonuses. And I quit that for I wasn't even making half of that in drifting, but I was one foot in IT, one foot in my passion. And I was just like, look, like I'm not going to lose my brain. And if I do, it's not even worth it, doesn't matter anyway, because it doesn't matter. So I was like, I'm going to take the risk. I believe in myself, I believe in the opportunity. And I just went for it and I quit my IT job and, and just went full time in 2007. And, um, you know, 08, uh, you know, so I was the whole time pounding on Ford's door Mm -hmm. and 2007, you know, we got some parts budget and it wasn't until 2010 that I actually got a Ford deal. And the same year I got monster and had so much momentum I mean, I was worked, I was chasing these companies for years. I mean, I was started talking to Monster in 2008. And 2010, I got part official partnership with Ford, official partnership with Monster. Um, and you know, that year I did skateboard car with Rob Deerdick. We did a big reveal at the Fantasy Factory, you know, um, all this momentum. And then, you know, obviously those were the ASD days won our championship in 2010 and things just kept progressing and progressing, right? This, this belief in myself and belief in, in what we were doing is just all attracting all these great things. And then 2012, um, decided that I wanted to go out on, you know, on my own and start my own team. It kind of got to the point where the goals of Falcon, rightfully so with their investments, you know, we're starting to get to a point where it was holding back my potential of growth. And so, um, you know, that's where, you know, 
we we started our own our own team and ASD effectively became RTR Motorsports at that time. So, you know, Ian uh, who led who owned ASD and led that up, you know, he became a partner and, you know, also a, a mentor and um, you know, we just transitioned everything that was in Charlotte to basically RTR and uh, that's when I, you know, partnered up with Nitto, which uh, this will be our 11th year working together. And uh, yeah, and it's it's just kind of from then on, from when we started our own team, it's just rocket shipped up because now, you know, more risk on my shoulders, but I was able to do whatever I wanted and have to answer to anybody. And I was just able to let all of my dreams and all of my passion unleash. And, um, you know, from that moment, our TR vehicles and our product line and everything really started just flowing and the motors and, and motorsport, you know, was just, you know, we were just doing really well. And, um, it's, it, it, it was, a very challenging transition, a lot of work, but once we kind of got it on the rails, we processed it and, and it just, it all worked. And, um, you know, being the serial entrepreneur that I am, I just, you know, always wanted more and, and, and was trying to figure out how to scale the business and, and had a passion of like seeing all, you know, helping another driver come up. And, and that's kind of where the opportunity for, for Chelsea came in, you know, in 2016, we started talking about running a, a third car or a second car and, um, you know, Chelsea kind of just kicked the door in and said, Hey, I'm going to be your driver. And uh, it was one of the best decisions I ever made. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's been, it's been a ride, you know, 20 years of, of passion, effort, you know, and, and sacrifice. And you are right. You know, a lot of people don't see that. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it is also an honor to be the guy that people see that is, you know, successful and, and being able, but I think that the, the story is the real thing because that's the real inspiration that, you know, I'm just a normal dude that just chased his dream. And so I think my, my story for everyone is like, just do what feels good to you and what you really believe in you can do while keeping your reality in check. You know, I didn't quit my IT job until I had at least some way, a means of living. Yeah. I didn't, you know, I, yes, I did max out a credit card, and yes, it did take me like five years to pay off. I, mean, I think it was like 12 grand to do that trip to California. And back then for me, that was like a ton of, ton of, yeah. I mean, it's still it's a lot still of money. Lot, yeah. <laughs> um, and it did take me years to pay that, that credit card off. But like compare that to college, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Compare that to like going to college for four years and having a hundred thousand dollars of debt, you know? So, um, you know, so I think, you know, you got to weigh it up, but believe in yourself and, and go for it and don't be scared. And, and that's, I'm really proud that I had the upbringing and parents that supported me in any way that I wanted to do, not financially, but mentally. And, you know, they always made me work for it. And, um, you know, one thing I, I do tell people about how I had to work for things like my mom gave me a $30 allotment for shoes and anything I wanted higher than that. I had to go make. Hmm. So if I didn't want to wear Chuck Taylors as a, you know, high schooler or middle schooler, I had to go buy some other, you know, make some money. And so that instilled the the ethic in me to go get what I want. And uh, that for that, I'm back then I was pissed about it, but I'm extremely grateful now. Man, I wish Chuck Taylors was still mom, 30 Dad. bucks, man. Like I paid like 140 <laughs> right? for my last set. And then, yeah. I, I believe uh, it. I do love those shoes though. They're, they're not great on my feet, but. Yeah, so that's. <laughs> So, yeah, so that's, I mean, that's in a summary. I mean, I could probably go on yeah. and on trials and tribulations. And I think, you know, another moment in there to, to kind of just step into is like, I met some of my best friends through this sport, you know, Drift Alliance, you know, for those of you that don't know it, we were just a brotherhood and, and of, of friends. It started out at E-Town, myself, Tony, Angelo, Forsberg, Turk, just were bros and we you know, Tony had the idea to kind of start this drift BMX team of drifters. And, uh, we all just kind of came together and, and we were stronger as a, as a crew and a team at the time. And, uh, you know, obviously eventually you know, most all of us were on Falcon and that all just kind of, kind of grew into this, you know, big, big umbrella for us. And then eventually, 
um, you know, we all started kind of having our own thing and it was hard to hold that together. But like those days are some of my greatest moments and, you know, and, and remembering, um, you know, that, that brotherhood and those, you know, working together to, to, to push each other to grow and to have these opportunities. So yeah, we need to do like a reunion tour or something. That'd be, that'd be incredible to have all you guys just on like some, yeah. like, I mean, you know, Falcon's got the big, the big rig. Uh, for like grid life and everything else, but I think we do a DA one and just get everybody back together and get everyone to shred in like low power cars again, like straight throwback. Yeah, it, it it would be it would be fun. We had some times, man. It was it was such a cool cool time. You know, we were always struggling. There's you know no money. I mean, the things that we did to get cars running and their stories for days on uh, with that that squad. So we'll save that for another time. Well, I think I think that stuff is important, <laughs> like like you touched on, that it's very easy from the outside fan perspective to just look at RTR and be like, oh yeah, it must be nice. But like there's every any anytime you see somebody where you say must be nice, there's always a story with how that situation came about. And I think, especially on the sponsorship end of things, that is like this weird dark art that doesn't get communicated enough that there's so many drivers out there that are struggling. I mean, even, even pros, like we see struggles this year, like drivers dropping out. And it's like, I I'm happy that you're discussing how difficult it was for you back then. Cause there's so many guys that just, just that, that could be incredibly talented that get frustrated with that process. And then just, that's it. It's over, you know, and then their careers. Over. It's harder now. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, it was kind of perfect storm when I got into drift because it was the, the first wave, right? Like if you look at it as a wave, first wave and we were riding it and then it started growing and we're still on it. So, and we were making, you know, I was making a name for myself from the things that I was doing and there was only a few people. So the, the pool was very small. I mean, back then you would call a track to go. That's why everything was in parking lots because tracks would be like, you want to do what at my track? You know, and now they're begging us. To come there because we bring the we bring the crowd and and we not just the crowd but the next generation and the future generation of automotive culture, and you know so the the thing with that and like my assessment of of people and sponsors and partners is you know I can't I don't blame them and I don't look at them like you're dumb like this is easy it's not easy but it's also like you've also got to have the car getting to the track to do the things. Mm-hmm. So it's like if you don't have the assets or the ability to have people getting the car ready for you so that you can focus on the important things, the content, the relationships, the the thinking about what's next, the trying to book yourself for events. You know, if you don't have that, it's really hard. And, um, you know, I talk to a lot of you. I I have a I'm, I'm, I'm an open book to people that that approach me. You know, I like sharing what I've learned because I want, you know, I'm at the point in my career, like it's fulfilling for me to see other people be successful. And, you know, I like sharing my knowledge and to, especially to people that can take it and use it. And so, you know, my biggest thing is like, we all as drivers, like we drive because we, you know, aside from fun drifting, right. Let's talk about competitive and wanting sponsors and wanting to make this a business, right. If you just want to have fun, do that. <laughs> You're going to pay for your stuff and you're going to go and build your car and have a good time as you want. But if you want to turn this into a business, you need to approach it like a business and you need to really step back and understand the market and what's important. And, and you know, now we're talking about the content, the being a good ambassador for brands, the the social, and, and most importantly, building your audience and being having a real group of people that you know, that, that believe in you and, and trust you and, and look to you for advices and influence. And that is more important right now in this moment in 2023 than it is to win a championship. And so, you know, people look at that backwards, you know, people like, Oh, I got to get out there. I got to be competing. I got to be winning to do that. But no, you can, you know, Adam show Adam is a perfect example. Mm -hmm. You can build an audience and build success first and then bring that success and brands that will want to work with you into professional motorsport. Now, there's multiple ways to do it, but the audience and the, the business side of it is as important as the driver skill and having the vehicle to do the job. So, you know, it's just a different approach and it's different, way different now, 20 years later than when we started 
um, on how you're going to do this. And so I always tell everyone, I'm like, man, don't go broke trying to win events. Go out, have fun, do things that people find interesting, build your audience. You'll get there. Mm -hmm. You know, trying to be a pro drifter and formula drift is literally being like, it, it's, it's harder to be a pro drifter than it is to be a major league baseball player. Just think about that. Yeah, I guess there's the 40 slots, right? Pro drivers. There's 40 drivers yeah. available in the world to do this sport. So when, you know, a lot of us have made it look so easy because people don't know the actual struggle because that's not the fun stuff to watch. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everyone sees all the glitz and glam and fun and big sponsors and badass cars and, you know, extravagant projects, but there's always more to the story. And, um, I think, you know, I, I just, I, I want to see people be successful, but there's a lot of people that just don't have realistic expectations. And, um, it's a hard, look I think you that you, you just have to take a hard look is. at what you're doing. It's not easy. I mean, it's, it hurts. Exactly. It, you got to be honest with yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And look, there's a lot of badass drivers out there. There's a lot of really good drivers. But if you look at all motorsport, there's a lot of them that never get the ride, that never get in because they don't have the other half. Mm -hmm. And um, that's just what it is. Like, this is motorsport. You know, it's it's not, you know, it's not, um, you know, intramural local, you know, sports and, you know, Dodgeball. sign up and pay 60 bucks to play soccer for the season. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's an interesting thing to think about and process. And I'm extremely grateful for my timing. You know, like if I was to start today, <laughs> it, 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 it's a road. I mean, it's a road. I mean, you've got, you've got, look what your competition is. You know, these refined, finely tuned machines and not just on the track, but, uh, other, uh, you know, other, other elements, um, you, you're competing against, but you can do it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, th I think you, you, you made a really good speech. It would have been probably 2018 or 2019 to the pro two class at that point in time. Uh, and I was working with Riley Sexsmith and that's, that's how I learned about this. And to, to try to quote you as much as possible, it was essentially the driving is the reward. Like that's, that's the final piece. That's the excitement that you get for everything else that you did to be here. Just that's it. That's that's the part that you, that's the treat. It's everything else that you did that's actually going to move you ahead, not not what happens on track. Yeah, I mean, and that and that's how you have to look at it. You know, like that's it. Yeah, it, you're not entitled to do professional motorsport. Yeah, you have to work for it. And every time you get in your car, you should be grateful that you're doing that because that is the reward of all of your effort that got you to that moment. And it's really easy for us to forget that. And it's also easy for us to not, not be in that moment and think about so many other things and not just take that in and be like, damn, I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. I'm doing what hundreds of thousands of other people dream of doing and I'm doing this. And so everybody that has a race car in their garage, who's busting their ass to get to the race track, there needs to be some gratitude through all that struggle because you're doing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you are, have earned this. It, nothing has ever been given. It doesn't get given to you. You know, these things don't come, you know, people don't come knocking on the door. You got to knock on the doors. You got to beat them down. You got to prove because you're fighting against hundreds of other people that are trying to do the same thing that you are, you know? So, yeah. Um, so yeah. Well, I think, I, I mean, there's obviously people that are like, oh, the guys that have the money, they can just buy their way in. It's like, well, we've seen that happen, but then we've also seen them disappear pretty quick. Like it's, it, you might be able to buy your way in, but you're not going to buy your way through every battle and every competition. Like, yeah, it, don't get me wrong. If, if I had the money to compete in FD, like if, if, if my family had that money, would I go for it? For sure. Would I be able to stay competitive? A hundred percent not. Because I, I know, I mean, I've been around you guys enough to be like, oh no, I don't have that thing inside of me that makes me, you know, do everything just to win. Like not, not in a bad or cheating way, but like I've, I've seen it enough now to know that I don't have that. And that even given the mm. best cars, that's big. the best training, like it wouldn't happen. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's big of you too. And and that's the type of 
that's the type of self-reflection that people need to have yeah. before they go for this. Because this is not a hob. You know, being a professional athlete is not a hobby. No. It is a lifestyle, and it, that is what comes needs to come first. You know, and um, and you know, fortunately, I was in a position to where I have already been. You know, prior to having ch- a kid, you know, I was able to, you know, get get a great amount of success, and now I'm able to have long term partners that trust and know that I'm going to work hard for them, no matter what I'm doing, on road, off road, you know, going to Disneyland, whatever <laughs> it may be. You know, I'm I'm going to you know curate and and do great things for them, and so, but you know, it all you know everyone says so cliche. It all happens for a reason, and and the way it happens is a reason, mm-hmm. and uh, that's totally been my story. Yeah, I I like that you touched on the on road off road stuff because you've obviously anybody who follows your career sees the transition to ultra ultra four, but we touched on the motocross stuff. Um, you've also I believe at one point you had your IMSA license or at least a GT license. And you even competed in the Canadian Tire Cup, Trois Rivières in Canada. So you've even done the whole yeah. left hand turn thing. Uh, yeah, well, that was more than left hand. Wait, no, that Trois Rivières. I, oh, now I got to remember. There's all left turns. Yeah, right. I know there's one right turn. <laughs> there's one right turn there. So, like, do you think, uh, is that, has that been super beneficial to your career in general? Or, like, is it been one of those, hey, I'm in an opportunity where I have the support, like, Let's just go. Let's just try it. Like, why not? Right? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I think the thing to say too is like for anyone that wants to get into motorsport, dirt bikes are like the absolute easy start. Mm-hmm. Like Mad Mike, myself, Ryan Turk, a lot of people, you know, look, Dylan Hughes, motocross, yeah. like motocross was such a good skill set for me because when I got into drifting, like I was just pretty good at it from motocross, from skateboarding, from BMX, you know? Um, and, and then once I got into drifting, drifting made me good at any other sport with four wheels. Because if you look at what it is, right, if you break down the dynamics, it's a steering wheel, with four tires, and you're sideways and spinning. The tires are spinning and you're feeling grip. So when you get in any, we're, you're so used to being past the limit of, you know, like past the limit of, of, um, of driving and what's supposed to be possible that when you get in these other sports that just live just below the limit, you're so comfortable, you know, a lot of road racing drivers and like guys that come up through karting and road racing, like they don't know what to do when they get beyond the limit. And so I wasn't the best road racer. You know, I did a Trans Am race. I did the, Na- the, the NASCAR race at Trois Tra- Rivière. Um, I've done a couple, you know, I did the time attack, a couple of time attacks and, and some road racing stuff. And I enjoy that as a, a driver. Um, not a big fan of watching, but, <laughs> but when I did it, um, I, I, I got to, I got up to speed very fast. I wasn't the best, but like I was rapidly up there because I was comfortable and my approach of like, okay, this is steering wheel, this is four tires, what's this car do? Okay, cool. It doesn't like that, doesn't like that, boom. I get acquainted very quickly, but I'm also not scared to get, you know, out of the, you know, uh, out of the comfort zone. Now, downforce cars are a little different story. You don't want those to get out of their comfort zone yeah. because they really go away. They bike but quick. um they bite quick, yeah. But um, but yeah, so for me, you know, drifting opened up these other opportunities for me, you know, and and you know, um I have partners like Monster and and Nitto and Ford, you know, new opportunities open up and people are looking for crossovers and and so for me, you know, like I told you, I wasn't very good at saying no. I just wanted to do fun, cool stuff. And uh so that's kind of how those crossover opportunities happen. And you know, the one that really stuck is Ultra Four. You know, Ultra Four USA and, and King of the Hammers, and you know how that came about is really, really interesting. You know, I say things don't fall from the sky. Well, this kind of fell from the sky because I was literally on the beach in Jamaica, and Harriet Nitto called me, and he's like, "Hey, uh, you, we have the we have a spec truck at King of the Hammers, and we were wondering if you wanted to try King of the Hammers." And I was like, "Is that that race with like the big boulders and canyons and like the desert and like?" crazy like that crazy crazy thing he's like yeah that and um you know so i was like absolutely i'm so in so that year i think it was 2016 
you know, I show up to the lake bed in a rental car. And for anyone that's ever been down Boone Road into King of the Hammers, like you probably should have a truck. But I'm, you know, beat bopping in the rental car. You know, I got brand new tennis shoes on, you know, I'm just showing up and, you know, uh, I get out and it's just like, you know, Mad Max meets Burning Man meets race trucks. And, you know, I, I get out and I go and check out this truck and, and uh, Lauren Healy, who's now my business partner and teammate in Fun Have Raw Off Road, is it hops into passenger seat. And I knew of him, you know, but he effectively was like the character I am in drifting, mm. you know, champion, you know, one of the guys to, to beat. And, and he was that, you know, so he's sitting next to me and kind of starts talking to me about the vehicle and takes me over to this, or I take him over, I'm driving, take him over to this this waterfall and literally it's like this so i'm at the bottom like looking at this thing and he's like you know drive up that hey everybody jacob here from the formula drift podcast we have an awesome deal for you so if you head over to shopfd.com and use coupon code podcast 23 you're gonna save 20 percent on any merch so anything you can find on that website use podcast 23 at shopfd.com save yourself 20 percent hats shirts lanyards wh whatever just, just use the code save yourself some money so why not? You know, don't, don't stop listening. Wait till the show's done, but then head over, shopfd.com, use podcast 23. We'll see you guys out there. And uh, I'm like, yeah, whatever. Like, this is what you tell, you know, all the rookies, right? And he's like, uh, he's like, go up, put it in four low and go up. I'm like, well, how do I put it in four low? And uh, that's just how green I am to like these type of vehicles. So anyway, I put, put the transfer case in four low and just, just drives right up this like, no, Back then, to me, it was like a 90-degree thing, and it was probably like 40 degrees but now, but um, it was insane. And so I got to the top, I'm like, okay, that's what it is. And and so I you know, did a little training leading up to the race, and that race, I finished top 10 in the Legends class, became the first crossover driver to finish King of the Hammers, let alone to get a top 10. And I was just hooked. Like, it was so fun, and the drive time that I got in it and the, the pre-running and everything about it was just really, really cool compared to what I was used to, which was three days at a track, you know, maybe 20 laps, 15 seconds at a time, you know, so it was a really cool contrast, and it was super challenging, and I really enjoyed it, and then I made the investment in uh, building – um building my first truck, OG Brocky, and, and debuted that in 2017. And, um, you know, really just, just started going. And, you know, that was a 4,500 class, which is um, the class below 44 where I'm at now. I won a championship in that class, ultimately got kicked out of it and forced to go up to the next <laughs> class. Um, You're too good. But Find I wanted to else. do it right. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to learn, you know, I wanted to learn – the right way and learn good, uh, you know, race craft and patience and the things that are required to, to achieve the goals that I have here in the top class now. And, you know, I won a championship, uh, in this top unlimited class in, uh, 21. And then last year I got second in the championship and, um, you know, I wouldn't say that I'm dominating, but I am because of drifting, I am, consistently extremely good is that like a lack of and fear that allows that that like you've 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 done so many I, crazy things over the years where like that fear response is completely muted yeah i think i think really for me is that i have a really good mental game you know drifting has made me i've studied the brain and really become a good mental player because drifting you know, in 2008, I realized that I was like really good in practice. I'd suck at qualifying and competition and it was all right here. And so I did a lot of studying the brain and understanding the mental because drift is really challenging. And the fact that you've got to be the best you've ever been in your life now. Mm -hmm. And that means getting out of the car, talking to fans, talking to partners, you know, resetting, like you're not in the car for 500 laps. You can't make mistakes. You got to be perfect. And so when I got in a sport that's, you know, hundreds of miles, you can make mistakes. Well, you can make some mistakes end your day, yeah. might even end your week or a couple months, but they, you know, you cannot be perfect. And that like the load that came off of me for that. And then you add the driving skill, right? The vehicle placement, the ability to feel traction, the ability to not be scared to toss a car 
sideways and 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 rotate a vehicle and and you know because these things don't really like to turn so um you know you you've got to you got to manhandle them and and um you know i was just so comfortable in all of those situations from motocross drifting and then the mental and so it's those things that have made me extremely good at this sport not to mention great mentors you know like lauren you know the jimmy's four by four crew like people that I got the shortcuts, you know, I'm not going to fake it. Like I got the, 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 I didn't get the shortcuts in driving, mm-hmm. but I got the shortcuts in the technology, the parts to use the vehicles, you know, and, and also the rocks, you know, I had some really good people to teach me how to approach the rocks and, and uh, I've got a badass co-driver too. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I approached this sport with all of my experience and that's what allowed me to rapidly excel in it. You know, this is one of those sports that's so much attrition and all the really top off-road drivers that have come into the sport have never really been able to dial it back and, and you know, rarely get to the finish line because they don't have that, the the patience and, and the, the ability to, to just dial it back. You know, it's more of a race of get to the finish and the results will happen. Mm-hmm. As long as you have a good pace, you're going to do good. It's not just like, ah, go the whole time, even though it looks and feels like that sometimes. So, um, so for me, it's, it's, it's really like, again, one of those things of like every step of the process has gotten me to be ready for the next. And, uh, the ultra four has just been amazing. And it's, you know, it's such an amazing sport from a family perspective. You know, you're out in these beautiful places. The family can come, you're out there for a couple of days. You know, my weekend consists of like getting there. My best friend's my co-driver. We go pre-run for hours, make notes, you know, you qualify and then you race. And it's just a really enjoyable, enjoyable sport. Uh, you know, pressure starting to get higher now that, you know, I'm starting to be one of the guys, with the bullseye on the back and, um, but I enjoy it. Like that's where I, that's where I excel and where I love living. And, and, um, it's been a lot of fun, you know, like I mentioned, and, you know, Lauren was me, you know, when we met and, you know, it, he was a, a equivalent to me in drift and like, he's helped me progress on the skill side and being able to be where I am. And I've helped him progress on the business and partner and content and audience growth side. So we've got like such a perfect compliment going on together. And it also checks that box for me of like helping and, and helping other people succeed through my experiences and, and what, you know, what I've been able to build. So it's yeah. a, a really epic thing. I love it. And I see myself, uh, you know, continually continuing to do it. So. Yeah. A lot can be gained by, by teaching. Like often you find your own weaknesses because you're, you're having to push somebody else. Right. Like it's, it's totally, it's one of those, you see them do it and you're like, I do the same thing. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Don't do that. And then you're like, okay, I got to stop doing that too. So <laughs> that's, that's totally, that's, are totally. You, are you planning on doing a, a full season again of, of ultra four? Yeah. So I'll be doing, um, I'll be doing five events of that. You know, we just King of the hammers was done. That was February. Yeah. We won in our stock class Bronco and I had a really rough day in the desert with my, uh, the unlimited class Bronco, but it, um, we finished and I've got, I think one of the best finishing rates in the series ever at this point, but, uh, it was a battle. I was out there for nine and a half hours. I was on my side for like 30 minutes. It was a, it was a serious, serious ass whooping this year, but it's those things, you know, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And it's, uh, it, it, you just, that race alone, King of the Hammers is like just a, unbelievable challenge of man machine team prep everything it's just really really cool and then the rest of the series is just racing in beautiful atmosphere or beautiful settings and and really challenging challenge yourself and so it's super cool so yeah i'm I'm gonna chase uh doing at least four rounds of that maybe five i'm gonna do a couple other desert races this year and just kind of expand my horizons and in that off-road community and do some cool enthusiast events and uh, yeah. Can we, I guess we should talk about what the the rest of the year looks like for you too. Cause you got a pretty, for, for a guy who only wants to do 15 events, I think it's starting to get loaded up pretty quick. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, um, you know, made the decision uh, this year, uh, you know, I'm definitely going to do some more, you know, enthusiast on-road events, right. With Mustang, you know, new S650 Mustangs coming out. 
Uh, that'll be out, I think, late this summer or this summer at some point. And really excited about that. And, you know, obviously Chelsea and I had, you know, worked with the teams to develop the electronic drift brake, which now, you know, you'll need to put a hydro in the Mustang. You just get one with that feature and turn it on. And That's it's so super, super yeah. sick. And, um, you know, with that, you know, with the new Mustang coming out and then mesh that with, you know, um, Adam, uh, you know, needing, needing some more time on his end, you know, we decided to, to share the season and I'm super pumped to be coming back to formula drift. You know, it wasn't my, wasn't like, you know, when I announced that I was taking a break, I had no plan. It was just, I knew I was taking a break. Yeah. And, um, you know, again, I just, I, I feel and, and what feels and what makes sense. And so, you know, with, with the reinvigoration from last year to, you know, and, and, and I, I never mentioned this to anybody, but like in 2021, it took a bit for me to like, you know, coming off my championship in 2020, mm -hmm. 2021 took a bit for me to like get to where I needed to be on the track. You know, it wasn't a bad year. It just was like. I, I, the passion was starting to burn out mm. and I love drifting so much and I was not willing to let that happen. So I, that's why I decided to take a break on formula D I've got people that are working too hard for me to come and be the half, the guy that they need in the car. And so that's what really made me decide, you know, and, and I had so many other things going on and so many business needs. I had to, something had to give. And, and that's why I decided to take a break. And I didn't know if it was going to be one year, two years, five years, never, um, but I wasn't willing to close the door because I love the sport. And, you know, like I mentioned last year really reinvigorated me and, you know, I'm, you know, it's all lined up perfect. You know, I'm excited to campaign is all new Mustang. Uh, we've made some amazing changes and, and, and the cars are going to be better than they ever have been. And it's going to be a lot of fun to, you know, come in and, and do a partial season, not have the pressure of a championship on me and just go out and drive and put my passion on the track instead of being so strategic, you know, as I have been constantly trying to win championships. I'm kind of like at the place where I'm like, look, I'm going to compete in formula drift. The people are going to see a different me than they ever have because I'm not there to win a championship. Mm -hmm. I'm there to do the best that I can and have the most fun for me and for them on the track at every round that I do this year. And so, um, I'm extremely excited to come back joining Chelsea, joining James. Uh, I would say joining Adam, but he won't be at the rounds that I'm at. You guys at, are going to so, swap then uh, uh, back and forth. Yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah, we've got we've got three cars, and then it will be James and Chelsea as the full-time championship efforts, uh, the focus, uh, focus drivers, and then we'll have myself and Adam uh, that are coming in. You know, Adam will continue his progression and his learnings, and uh, I'm just going to come in, have fun, and throw it down the best that I can every round. And um, I'm, I'm extremely excited for that opportunity and extremely grateful for, you know, our partners to, you know, believe in that as a, as a recipe and something to continue to to invest in with us. And so, yeah, it's going to be uh, – wow. It's going to be rad. I'm, I'm super jazzed. Like, I've not been so excited about a Formula Drift season – you know, and in, in, in a very long time, it's going to be a whole new perspective. And I think with the the lineup that we have, like the progression and the way that we're going to be pushing each other under the RTR awning, it's going to be nuts. And the fans have some treats coming. This shit is going to get wild. I, I think it gives you guys like a really unique situation too, where if there's a setup thing, because Chelsea already kind of spoke about how he has particular things that he likes in a car. James has particular things that he likes in a car. But now you kind of have this ability where because the pressure to win a championship is off of you, you can be like, you know what, guys? Let's see if it works. Like, throw that on mine. I'll take it out. I'll let you know. And if if I feel something positive, cool. Yeah, we're going to change that. So, like, on a strategic front, it it opens up a lot of possibilities. For sure. And we've not really spoke too much about that. Like, we're still at this, in this moment, very much like, hey, you know, hey, each driver, you know, we we share the data, mm -hmm. but each driver kind of likes their different things. But I think as the season goes on, there could be some more strategy that that is entails in that and and that can end up being a benefit, you know, for for everybody. Um, so 
it's it's going to be exciting. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm you know, it's been so fun to watch Chelsea. You know, it's been it's been such a constant battle because Chelsea you know, so me, my perspective of me as a driver, like coming into the sport, you know, I was always the big angle, big smoke, just tossing the car, big flicks. Mm-hmm. And then as things grew and it became more professional and things were on the line, I started to get more strategic and was playing to win. Qualifying, stuff like that. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. yeah everything. Just playing to win. Right. And you leave some stuff out when you do that, but this is professional motorsport and that's what we're there to do. And Chelsea... You know, we, I've wanted him to win. I've wanted him to get those results. But Chelsea's perspective, you know, Chelsea wants to win his way. Mm-hmm. And it took a little while for me to accept that. But then I started to really respect that. And, you know, I want Chelsea to win a championship so bad for him. But it's like, who am I to want something for him that in a different way than he wants it? And so I became very accepting the fact that, you know, he's committed to going out and doing what he wants to do on the track and how he wants to win. And when he wins that championship, it'll be the most special championship from ever rather than just playing to win. And uh, again, it took a lot for me to, to understand and respect that, but he held strong on it through many discussions because, you know, watch the video, roll it back. Watch how many times Chelsea has lost because someone's beat Chelsea. There's not that yeah. many. It's Chelsea's beat himself. And, it, and I would see, I'm like, yo, I watched you drive anything. In any moment, you can get the car where you want it. So why are you having these dumb mistakes? Why are you getting so aggressive? You know, and it's in those moments, like that's what's exciting and fun to him. And that's what he stood strong to. And so I've earned a great respect for his approach to the sport. And I am, and we are as a team, supportive of him. And I think that that's why you get to see such exciting moments when Chelsea's on the track is why everyone pays attention because just like I mentioned, not, not to mention Chelsea is my child, mm-hmm. but my philosophy of letting my child be them and, and who they want to be, like some of that has come from the learnings I've had with with watching Chelsea and trying to get Chelsea to move a little bit over. And he has moved a little bit over but he's never going to go all the way. You know, we could have won multiple championships with Chelsea if he was willing to just play the game. Mm-hmm. And um, he, he's not, and he's made it very clear. And uh, I would respect that greatly about him. And so for me, for the first time ever, I get to come and do what I want to do and just throw it down hard and, and you know, put it all on the line. So it's going to be exciting. I'm, I'm expecting uh, great things. I'm expecting exciting things. I mean, the moment when James and Chelsea battle with oh. those Mustangs, holy sh- Yeah. Like, oh, I know. If I'm on the line next, I'm getting out of the car and finding the live stream to go watch it. Like, it, you know, that's those are the moments I'm excited about. Me battling Chelsea, James battling Chelsea. Like, you know, Adam getting the opportunity to do that. Like, it's just exciting, you know, um, for to, just because they're the same cars. Mm-hmm. And Equal then equipment. you can really see style and 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 personality shine in those moments. So I'm excited. You know, I feel like uh, Formula Drift is the fans are just so pumped. Like I can when we announced James, like I could physically feel the energy from this office right here when I'm watching, seeing the comments, seeing everything grow, and it's just like this vibe. You know, it's like finally he's coming back. You know, and so it feels good, and everyone's excited about it you know everyone's supportive of it man um yeah i'm just i'm i'm stoked man i'm like my fire is burning inside and i'm i'm ready you know the cars right now literally uh you know everything is just getting is is ready to rock and um yeah it's gonna be wild how i i mean i don't know the timeline chelsea kind of divulged a little bit in his podcast where he said this is this has been a longer discussion than probably what a lot of people know but like was your decision to come back triggered by James coming in or Adam kind of stepping aside? Did they all kind of happen in and around the same time? Like from my perspective, I could see you being like, uh, you know, James is coming in. Then you sit in the gun, like, man, equal equipment. Like I got to know, like, I have to know what that's like. Like, (laughs) That's how I see it. I mean, (laughs) nah, nah, there's, there's zero ego and zero anything to prove for me personally. I, um, it's all just passion and and wanting to to have to have fun. And so, 
I shouldn't say fun. Like I want to compete. Yeah. I want to get some of that competitive juices flowing again inside of drifting. Um, and so Jane, so the James thing has been, has been discussed, you know, when, when we were 2021, I think it was maybe even 2020, uh, one around the same time that we were commun- talking with Adam, I met and saw James in uh, in the UK at a Goodwood event. Right. We took the Mach E fourteen hundred out there, and in his documentary that they just did, um, there's a moment of he and I sitting and talking. What we we're talking about was the fact that he does want to come back to FD, uh-huh. and the fact that he he's had a ton of opportunities to come back, but he wants to come back with the best team, he, and he believes we're the best team, and he wants to come with us and. You know, I've known James for a long time since he came, you know, since he was 16 years old and came to to Irwindale. Um, and, you know, I, I've been helping him in the background in some way or another, you know, since we met. And, you know, his family's amazing. He's in his the first moment I met him, his passion just oozed. And and when I watched him drive, I'm like, oh, this kid is legit. And so, you know, I always just made myself available to him throughout his career. If, you know, I could assist him. And so we built a decent friendship and, you know, I love his, you know, his parents and I are always chatting when they're in town and, and, um, you know, it was just a good vibe. And so, you know, we had that combo and to me, I was just like, yeah, I'd love to figure out how to make it work. And, um, you know, we, but at the time, you know, I knew that we were working something with Adam and, and I didn't really see the path for it. And then when, you know, it, it, it was clear that it made sense, you know, and, you know, Adam has a ton of things going on and, and <laughs> to achieve the goals that he wanted to achieve, it takes a ton of commitment and a lot of time, not only to just, you know, support the financial needs from the partners and the things that have to be done to, to justify that, but also where you got to get in your mental leading up and, and the effort that it takes to perform. It's a lot. And I think that right now, you know, and that's a combo I had for Adam. I, you know, I was like, look, man, like this is a lot. And I can't, I can't sit here and tell you that, that, that this all makes sense for you to like shift your focus. Like you've got Drift HQ, you've got YouTube, you're getting, you know, you've got all these you know, TV show opportunities. And it's like, you know, like, this here has to be passion and this has to be like, you have to live this. This isn't like an in and out of mm-hmm. it. And, and I think he really realized that last year and agreed. And that's where we came up with the idea of he and I sharing, you know, a car. Okay. So that's really that opportunity and was like the perfect storm for me too. You know, you got two guys that want to do some of our things, but love the competitive aspect of drifting and love formula drift. But, how do you do it without doing a full season and the commitment that that does that? So like it created this perfect opportunity for him to get some life back and still be with the team that he wants to be and, and conquer and continue pushing himself. And it allowed me to be able to come in and not have that full commitment that I, that is needed to run a full championship chase. And so it was like the perfect storm and it just made sense. And, you know, couple that with me being invigorated, reinvigorated and excited to get back and competing. It just made sense. And so there was not like, you know, this was, I would say that this was probably being talked about leading into Irwindale okay. last year. So that's probably the timeline on that. And then parallel, you know, James, you know, in parallel, you know, James conversation still going on. Mm-hmm. So it's basically like, okay, I see how this can work. Uh, okay. Chelsea continue his continue his path. James come in. James becomes a championship effort with the partners that are in for the long haul, right? AutoZone, Type S, Optima, Pennzoil, right? Basically, that program last year that Adam was running, they, you know, let's get James in that program so that we can, you know, have those two focused efforts. And then Adam and I will share a car Mm -hmm. and, and, and basically, you know, when Adam drives it, it'll be his livery with his partners. And when I drive it, it'll be my livery with my partners. And, and basically, you know, we will 
have the opportunity to like battle for a car championship because they have that car championship now. But we won't, you know, and, and it's not even about a championship, yeah. but it would be kind of cool to win something with Adam. But, you know, now we both get to, you know, choose some of the tracks that we want to run um, and and what works within our schedule and that, you know, we can show up and give our all in that moment for that race or for those races. So it, it just all lined up, you know, and the universe is a wild thing, right? It just all lined up. Everybody was supportive. You know, uh, the AutoZone, you know, and all that partner program was very excited about having James. Yeah. <laughs> They're also supporting Adam as well, you know, and, 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 you know, so it just, it, it all worked, you know, all the effort that Adam put in last year to support these partners, he built a great relationship and, and, you know, so now there's, you know, um, it, we just were able to put it all together and, and my partners are very supportive of what I want to do in general. You know, they believe in me. I've proven myself to them. And, and like I said earlier, they know we're going to, we're going to get it done and, and help them achieve their goals out there. So, uh, so yeah, it's, it's really the perfect storm and that's really how it's going to go down. So for four rounds, you're going to see James, Chelsea, and Adam and four rounds, you're going to see James, Chelsea, and myself. And, um, we will be, uh, you know, announcing those rounds, uh, pretty quickly. Um, Back, I think I could go ahead and just tell you. I'll take it now. I mean, some things are are subject to change, of course. but uh, Adam will be doing Long Beach, New Jersey, St. Louis, and oh, let me come back to that because I'm doing Atlanta, Seattle, Irwindale, Utah. So I just leave Florida so for him. Florida. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Duh. So Adam's doing Orlando. Yeah. So Orlando, Long Beach, St. Louis, and Florida. Interesting. That's yeah. So that's that's the plan. All right. I like it. Yep. And uh yeah, so it's it's exciting. It's never been done before. Uh Formula Drift was was really cool to work with us on it. And um you know, we're going to go out and, and give it our all in, in every moment. And uh, I'm excited. I'm excited. I get to be a fan for four events. I get to be a competitor for four events. And uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see where it all shakes out. And um, our new cars are just absurd. They look, it's the best looking cars that we've ever had, in my opinion. And um, yeah, let's, you know, I'm excited to see what happens around one. Do you guys have like drastically different seating positions or is it going to be fairly easy to like transfer? Like obviously the rap guy is going to have Adam a bunch of work and I, to do. <laughs> Adam and I are very, Adam and I are very similar. Like when he got in, you know, cause the car he drove last year was my car. Right. So we're, we're actually building James and James he's, got a right hand drive huge. car built for him. Yeah. He's huge. And we had, to, we already had a car like slightly built. So we had to modify some stuff, but, um, so yeah, uh, but Adam's not much changes, you know, which seating position is a little bit, uh, a little bit different. And then, um, handbrake position I think is maybe a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So we'll have a checklist between rounds. We'll have two complete different bodies. Um, and then the bodies will just, you know, change, you know, everything's on these cars are built for crash damage. So quarter panels come off, doors come off, fenders come off hood, you know? And so that's all that'll, you know, we'll just have a completely separate body for me. And, um, you know, it's, it's not going to be the easiest thing, but, uh, you know, we'll make it work and, uh, certainly easier than, and cheaper than building a fourth car when you don't need it. And, you know, my expectation is that, um, you know, we'll see where it goes. You know, Adam will do a, a more limited schedule and, you know, what his future is, you know, I think RTR will always have a relationship with Adam, whether it's in formula drift or not, but, you know, whatever he wants to do is up for discussion and, and, you know, maybe one day he'll want to come back and do a full a full season, you know, and that may be once he gets some of the other many things he's got going on settled and he feels like he wants to have that that effort and fire towards it. But I really commend Adam. You know, if you step back and look, right, you know, you're, you're with arguably, you know, one of the best teams in the world. You've got the equipment. You can show up and drive. You know, a lot of the things are managed for you. Like it's a perfect case scenario. Mm -hmm. And so you have to commend a guy that's able to, to really step back, has this, you know, dream scenario, but realizes his bigger picture. 
and and realizes where he needs to you know focus his efforts and have that tough discussion Mm -hmm. you know after just one year and you know we put made so much investment and put so much around it you know to have that discussion and then everybody work together to figure out a way to still make it all work um so i you know i commend him for bringing up the tough discussion and then us as a team working together to still achieve you know mutual goals and and find the fun in the middle so I think I think uh, it comes it's down really to like, perfect storm and it's it's business like it's nothing it's nothing personal I mean you know I'm sure you've had plenty of these conversations where it's like hey like I'm not mad like I get it this is a business decision it seems like yeah it was, well you know I was I was a big proponent of it you know like as you know because I got it very involved in understanding things Adam does and he got very involved you know like there's been a very big trade of of business because you know we both come from a different place right if you look at adam like youtube and like that game he's got yeah. but he doesn't didn't have any of like the larger brand partnership game and how this game really works and so there was a really cool like tech transfer and so as i got involved in what he's doing he got to learn what we're doing and really what it takes there was a big learning of like wow like phew, way more than i ever thought it was and i'm like this is a, it's a lot you know, and, and you got all this going on. Like, I can't sit here and like try to tell you that putting all this effort in is what you should be doing right now. And Adam's a sharp business guy. Yeah. And, um, you know, so it, it really wasn't like a, ever a bad negative combo. It was just like, Hey, this is what's flowing. You know, this is how the, the it's flowing and this is what makes sense. So like, how do we, how do we make it work? You know? And, and, and this is what we came up with. And, uh, I think it's like the best case scenario, ever for everybody. So I'm, um, I'm stoked. Yeah. It's, it's going to be like an absolutely incredible year. I mean, the more, the more I talk about this year, the more I talk with everybody about it, the more excited I get. And I know it's, you know, every year, oh, it's going to be the greatest year of drifting, but it's like, we really haven't seen this level of, of either changes or, or new drivers or whatever. I, I don't know when, like, I really don't know when you've had this many champions all driving together when you've had this level of competition this like this fast like everything is putting this together to be a perfect storm like in the best possible way yeah like yeah it's it's so cool to think about like we're just giddy over here man like i straight up like the whole team is and um it's wild you know like it's it's so cool for me to watch people get in and adapt to our cars mm-hmm. and watching james it's like he's been driving it forever. And I'm sure some things will show up on the track. You know, it's always different when you get into competition and, you know, it, it, it could turn into a little more of a learning than, than any of us expect. But like that kid's driving uh, prowess and everything he touches. ability is just so next level. And like him and Chelsea, the way they're going to push each other good and bad is going to be freaking nuts. Yeah, that dynamic is, is going to be nuts. That dynamic is going to be cool like james is a very very nice guy but like you know don't don't get it twisted the dude comes to win like don't get that yeah it. like that that's, that's it. That, he is the most competitive dude him and joey logano yeah. are the most competitive people i've ever met which is funny because like you see interviews with joey and it is very similar to james in the regard that they're very you know up front they're very polite they're you know they almost seem kind of quiet and shy but then once again you see them drive and it's like a completely different animal behind the wheel Oh yeah. 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 And, and that's motorsport, man. It brings out like the quietest people. It brings out the fire. Yeah. People put a helmet on there. They become a completely different person. And the key is to like harnessing that different person. And uh, James has fully harnessed it and he is an absolute weapon. And, and um, yeah, yeah, we can talk about it all day, but it's exciting and it's about to start to unfold. So yeah, uh, yeah, let's uh, let's get it. It's you know it's been interesting, interesting off se- off season for the team. You know, building three new cars that don't exist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, you know the we've been you know, obviously building these things, and you know Ford's been you know getting parts and pulling things off prototypes to get us and and stuff like that. And so it's been a a full full team effort. You know, I mean, even loading into Long Beach, we're still waiting on bumpers. You know, we got we're very thin on bumpers going into Long Shocker. Beach because they don't exist. <laughs> So, uh, you know, Long Beach is the, you know, we usually take 10 bumpers to Long Beach and we've got like two or three per car. So, uh, you may see a couple zip tied on there, uh, multiple times versus freshies that we normally have. So, 
Uh, but it's it's exciting, and um, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get it, man. It's gonna be. How, how many projects do you guys have on the go at any given time? Because like obviously this is three cars, and then you know yeah. I feel like there's always something in that secret room that's that's hiding. I mean, th- there's got to be four or five projects at, at every moment. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, like motorsport is just one thing, yeah. right? So like my, I have a, we have a full blown off-road fully staffed shop and team in New Mexico, right? That's the fun haver off-road team. You know, Lauren leads that and we've got full off-road staff there. So there's constantly stuff going on on that front. Then under this roof, we've got motorsport, which consists of, you know, three formula drift competition cars, three exhibition, you know, demo cars, which are kind of the facts, the, the, the basically replicas of the FD cars that are just a little bit toned mm-hmm. down. Right. And then all the other demo vehicles, right. The Fox body, the Mach-E 1400, we've got a really, really cool, uh, project that we're doing with Ford right now. I can't really speak to, but like, that's another build, but you know, the, the, con- the, the competition, then the demo, then we've got full media team yeah. here that's constantly working on content projects to support motorsport and also support our partners, you know, special project goals. Then we've got RTR vehicles, which is continuing constantly prototyping, test fitting new products, conceptualizing new products, you know, marketing, sales, all of that. So it is a busy, busy, very fast growing business. And you know, everybody wears multiple hats here. You know, this is still a startup, even though there's 60 people here, we're still a fast growing business. And, you know, I'm having a entrepreneurial president as me, and, you know, there's always new ideas and new things and new opportunities being generated. And so, you know, my focus right now is really like looking at like our core stuff. And then it used to be again, yes, yes, yes. But now when it comes to special projects and other things, like they can become a distraction as much as they are exciting, they become a distraction. And so I need to get, I need to start scaling that back, those opportunities back and picking only the ones that make sense for us because I'm, you know, very quickly exhausting our guys. And we've had a couple moments where like things stack up on each other and we're just not prepared. We get it done and we power through it, but we've got to get better at being a little bit more strategic on that. So the long answer to your question is we've got a ton of things going on. At, or short answer is a ton of things going on at every mo- in, in every moment, but I'm also always trying to get better for my team to uh, not, you know, not, not run them into the ground. So um, it's a, lot of moving it's a parts. great problem to have. Yeah, it's a great problem. It is a lot of moving parts. And I've got a great team. You know, I'm able to not be in the weeds all the time and continue to grow, you know, future business to be able to kind of be an assist and, and a, a, you know, the tastemaker and a visionary. But I do get bogged down into some of the, the nitty gritty every now and then when, you know, when needed. But, you know, we got a great group that just runs with the dream and makes it happen. So. Yeah. For that, I'm extremely grateful. How, how do you manage all that time? Like, uh, I mean, admittedly, uh, when we were planning this, like I'm working through somebody on your team to get all this set up. Is that like, that's a very difficult decision to have somebody. I, I, don't, I mean, like, I don't know his his role, if he's considered an assistant or just like dude that takes care of shit. Like that's a that's a weird moment to be like, my life is so busy. I need someone to help me with all of it. Yeah. I, and, and it, th- you know, he's my time machine. Yeah. That's literally his job. Um, and, and so, you know, he's, he's a amazing dude. He comes from the production world okay. and he's used to keeping a lot of balls in motion all the time. And so it got to a point where I was just dropping balls. Like it got to the point where somebody requesting a call for me was that little thing was so overwhelming mm-hmm. to like, take the time to look at the calendar to see where it could fit in. And I'm like, look, I just need some help. And, but he's been one of the best investments for me and my goal of having time back because I set a box of when I'm available and he lives within that box. And if there's really important things, you know, we talk about where it can fit outside of the box, but I just drop a ton on him. (laughs) He's constantly hounding me. You know, when I come to the office, I got a hot sheet on my desk that I'm able to prioritize and focus on the things that I just need to knock out. And, um, it's been very helpful and definitely, 
you know, it's almost embarrassing to be like, yeah, you need to talk to my, my assistant. Cause I'm like, I'm not that guy. Yeah. I'm still the same guy that was, you know, in his S13 with no air conditioning, you know, with tires, you know, scrunched up driving to drift out Wednesday at E-Town, you know? So for me, it's still kind of a weird thing. It's a weird thing to drive up to this building every day and see my, you know, company logo on this massive ex NASCAR building. And all of it is still very surreal to me because of who I am and, and, you know, what I've come up from, Mm -hmm. you know, and, um, but I, you know, pinch myself and, and, and express gratitude every day for, for what we're doing and the type of people we get to work with. And, um, it's, it's a, you know, it, it's, a, it's an ever growing, ever changing machine and it gets stressful and it gets to be a lot of pressure, you know, when you've got 60 families that you're feeding, but I try to just believe in, um, in the team and what we're doing and, also have the realization too that like as big as this is like this is the small stuff Mm -hmm. you know like yo we're here on earth living a life and it needs to be lived and and your time needs to be focused in on the things that you love and that's how i live like i love everything that i do uh and every day i wake up i've never been like oh i gotta go to the office today like i it's more like oh i gotta leave the family yeah but I'm still going to do what I love to do. And, um, that, you know, that for me, that's it. Like, that's, that's how I want to live every day for the rest of my life is being excited about what I'm doing. So I, I've kind of asked this to everybody so far, and I, I'm very curious for your answer. And that is like, have you had a moment where you went like, Oh shit, this is it. Like I did the thing. Like this is like that, that, that moment where you realize like everything has changed Everything is now different, but obviously in the, in the most positive light possible. No. No? Is it just like small moments that, you know, you are constantly yeah, happening? It's, yeah, it's, yeah, there's, there, like it, I think when I have that moment, like I'll be done, mm. you know? Like for me, like there's successes along the way. You know, but it's an interesting thing. Like, for instance, a championship, right? Like, people would think, like, that's the end all be all. Literally, after winning the championship in 2020, I'll never forget this. I get off the podium, spraying champagne, boom. We literally are back at the trailer talking about how we could have been better, what we want to do to focus on next year. You know, it's like to have the drive to do the things that we're doing and we want to do, there's no like end glory. Like early on, you think that, yeah. right? Like as a as a young competitor or young athlete, you think it's about that moment. But once you get that moment, you realize it's not that moment. And it's so cliche. It's the journey, you know? I'll give you a couple examples, you know, like the RTRX. You know, that was one of my first major, major builds. Yeah. You know, it put RTR on the map. It was the big brother. It's why the, you know, why we built the Hunicorn with for Ken. You know, it's, it's, um, you know, and, and when that car was done, like it was cool, it was done, but it was like the process, the conceptualizing, the people that you work with, the struggles, the way, you know, the way that it got done, like that is what it's about. So the championship, you know, it's not about like winning a championship, you know, and then like, you know, you set goals, like when you're younger, you set goals of money you want to make, and then you make that kind of money. And it's not about, Oh, I made that kind of money because things don't change. Yeah. You know, the toys get a little bit bigger and the bills get bigger, but it's like, it's not about making that kind of money because you don't change or hopefully you don't change, yeah. you know? And uh, so what I've realized for me is it's about the journey. And when you take that moment to like reflect and look at it, You know, then you get that like, oh, wow, like we're doing this. Not like we've done that or we did that. It's like, yeah, we're doing it. It's like a checkpoint. I remember when, right. I remember when I thought about doing this and it was a dream and now we're doing it. And then there's a moment of pride and you get lost in that for a second. And then you're just like, okay, how can we do it better? Yeah. What's next? You know? And, and so, but that is the things that drive the disruptors and the, the tastemakers and the visionaries, you know, it's like, if there was always an end goal, 
and you got to it, you'd see a lot of things just stop, right? Like if Elon Musk stopped when he, you know, got to the moon, you know, there, there wouldn't be, you know, wouldn't be doing, you know, commercial flights to it, you know, like, you know, so it's just like, you know, you, you have this constant, you know, constant things that come flowing to you and the ones that you choose to act on and put your passion to, it's the journey that, that is what I believe drives most of us. Um, others may have it different. Others may say, Hey, look, I want, you know, $10 million in the bank and I'm going to go get an RV and I'm going to travel the world and that's it. And I'm, that's what I'm Doesn't done. Sound terrible. But st- I would still <laughs> argue, I would still argue that it's the journey. They got the money in the bank, but it's the journeying after that is what they're enjoying. Mm. So, uh, for me, it's very much the journeys and, you know, the trials and, and tribulations that come in between there that grow us as humans, that get us connected with other people, those lifelong friendships, the people we learn that we love working with, the people we learn we never want to work with again, the ups, the bads, the downs, like that's what makes it. And that's what inspires you onto the next one. And uh, that's at least, you know, my uh, 42 years on this earth's uh, perspective. I mean, I think that's, I mean, it's, it's taken you this far, so I can't argue with it by any means. Like, obviously you are where you are because of that perspective, that motivation, that thought process. And that's, I mean, that's how it happened, really. Yeah, well, there's no right or wrong, yeah. right? And it'll be different for everybody, yeah. you know? I mean, you may get that answer from 10 people and you may get a completely opposite answer, you know, for 10 people. Um, but the thing that's most important is that whatever they're doing and their approach to it is fulfilling them. And, uh, that's, you know, that's the key. No, that's, that's perfect. Well, is there, is there anything else that you want to cover before this season kicks off or any, any other big projects we can talk about? I want to be cognizant of your time because I know how busy you are. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, um, no, I, I really appreciate, you know, the opportunity to, to kind of have this discussion and get some of these things out, um, and, you know, to the public and, you know, I don't get to sit down and have this and it's fun for me to kind of brain jog and, and just have these types of combos. And I think, you know, exciting for me, you know, coming up this year, you know, we've got a ton of great content projects coming up, a lot of fun things that we're like working on to, to entertain the, the motorsports world. I'm extremely excited about the new, you know, S650 Ford Mustang. It's, it looks sick. We, we've got some, you know, RTRs got some great things coming for it, which we're going to, uh, debut uh, that car here early summer, late spring. So people will see what the new RTR production car that people get their hands on will look like. Nice. Um, Chelsea and I have, uh, you know, a lot of fun ideas of, of some things we want to do. You know, we just did a battle in our Fox bodies and drag race in those. And so, you know, I really want to get those guys over into off road a little bit. So I'm going to try to, you know, get James and Chelsea and Adam to come play a little bit and, maybe not race yet, but just start coming and playing a little bit. And, um, you know, so just, yeah, just trying to keep the fun up and, you know, I'm focused on, you know, doing some more vlog stuff and bringing people into the day to day around events and things that we do on my, my YouTube channel. So give me, give me a like and subscribe friends and, um, yeah, stay tuned. And I really just want to express a lot of gratitude and a thank you to everybody that has been supporting, you know, myself, RTR, all of our amazing partners, you know, for the last 20 years, you know, it's because of you guys that I'm able to do this and live my dream and feed those 60 families and, and, and my family. And, you know, it's, it's my goal and, and, you know, I want to keep inspiring and, and entertaining and, you know, bringing great products to the market and, and bringing fun. You know, I think the world needs a lot more fun right now <laughs> and uh, forever into the future. And, and that's what being a fun haver is about. And so, you know, I really appreciate everybody that has been a supporter of us, no matter what we do, where we are. Um, it's, you know, it means a lot and um, it's not lost on uh, on me. So thank you. Hey, well, thank you for coming on. I'm glad we could get this arranged. I'm glad we could uh, chat about the season. I'm, to, to say the least, I'm, I'm incredibly excited. I'm stoked to have you kind of in the pits again, either driving or not driving. Either way, um, always an awesome presence to have in the in the paddock. Uh, thank you for everybody for listening. If you haven't checked out Vaughn's stuff, definitely do it. Some behind the scenes with Spooky Shreds. Uh, those were some awesome, awesome videos. 
Um, I, I mean, obviously the drag racing stuff, EcoBoost for the win. Sorry, 5-0, but... Yeah, yep. Josie smoked oh, me. Man, I, I had the money on the 5-0. I should have known better. But uh, yeah, and, and thank <laughs> everybody for listening. We really appreciate it. The feedback on the podcast has been incredible. Um, I am trying to answer every comment. We are trying to improve something every single episode. So we appreciate it. If you guys like this stuff, please share it with a friend uh, because that's the only way we're going to grow. So thank you again, everybody, for listening to The Outer Zone. Once again, I'm Jacob Gettins, Mr. Vaughn Gettin Jr., and uh, we'll catch you guys next week. 